Okay, uh, welcome to What's Up Over Edmonton for July of 2021. My name is uh, Jeff Robertson. I'm a member of the Edmonton Center of the RESC. Uh, my current position is that of past president. Um, I always start with a picture of the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Queen Elizabeth Planetarium here in Edmonton, uh, Canada's first public planetarium for any of you who are not from Edmonton. Um, the idea of these uh, Wednesday night sessions that I do and other people do um, throughout the year is was to hold them in this, uh, this building, which has recently uh, been renovated. Um, they're just finishing it up. Uh, it was supposed to be open last year, but because of COVID, uh, everything has been put on hold. Eventually we plan to hold these things live and in person, um, but we're also going to try and stream them out because we seem to have a some sort of an audience online. Uh, we call this What's Up Over Edmonton because uh, the sky in Edmonton, where we're located at 53 degrees north latitude, is quite a bit different from uh, where most of the people in Canada live. This is uh, the sky at 11 p.m. on July 5th from Toronto. And I always like to point out the uh, constellation Scorpio. That's this guy right here. Um, in Toronto or in Southern Ontario, uh, you can see the entire constellation. But in Edmonton at 11 p.m. on July 5th, uh, we never get to see the whole constellation. Uh, this is about as best we get of Scorpio. We get to see uh, the bright uh, red giant Antares, which is right there. but we never get to see its uh, tail and stinger. Most of the information I use comes out of the Observer's Handbook, uh, which is put out by the RESC uh, every year. Uh, it is, uh, you know, I always say it's many pages, so I'm gonna pick up my copy right here. 352 pages of uh, good information uh, for uh, the Observer. Um, I also use uh, Astronomy Magazine and Sky News for uh, some of the uh, monthly uh, events. Just got a review from June. Uh, I mentioned that uh, the Moon and uh, Venus would be teaming up. Uh, this is a picture that Adolf Sterling, who is joining us tonight, uh, took on that night. Um, I went out just with a pair of binoculars to uh, to observe this uh, because I thought it would look pretty cool, which it did. So what do we got uh, coming up in Edmonton on uh, the 21st? So I've got short nights, endless twilights, and a few and few mosquitoes. We haven't had too many mosquitoes because we haven't had very much rain. It's very, very dry out there. And uh, we just went through a record heat wave and uh, now we have heat warnings on uh, in the city again tonight. So perpetual twilight, which has been going on since the middle of May, ends on July 31st. And it's the last chance to see noctilucent clouds. Jupiter and Saturn are returning to the evening sky by month end. Mars and Venus meet up low in the northwest sky at dusk. It's prime viewing time for satellites uh, with the sun just below the horizon. Uh, you get to see all kinds of satellites. Um, right now, the ISS is not uh, prime in a prime location in its orbit over Edmonton at nighttime, uh, but maybe a little later on in the month, uh, you can see it three, four, five times in the uh, evening if you want to stay up all night. Okay, we're gonna start the planetarium portion of uh, this presentation. And uh, the program I use is Starry Night. At uh, 10.30 is the time I have set for uh, the month of July, 10.30 Mountain Daylight Time in Edmonton. So uh, we've got Venus and Mars in the uh, west-northwest sky at 10.30. The sun has set at 10.02. You can still see the glow of it uh, on the horizon. 
as we advance through the month, uh, day at a time, you can see that they're getting a little bit lower. And uh, there's the moon popping into view. Now on the 11th, uh, the Mars, Venus, and the moon are make a very nice picture. Now I must say that they are only about six degrees above the horizon. So you're need you're going to need to you know find some place with a nice flat horizon like I've uh, pictured here in Starry Night. Um, I could put something a little more realistic for where I uh, am with trees and houses all over the place, but that would kind of defeat the purpose, wouldn't it? As we keep going, um, moon goes by, and on the 13th, Venus and Mars are very close together. They're around half a degree apart from one another, and that's about the diameter of uh, uh, the full moon. Again, uh, very low to the horizon. They're actually getting lower each night at this time. And I'm going to explain uh, that in relationship to Venus anyway. Mars is getting lower because it's getting uh, further and further uh, away from us, from our point of view, and it will eventually uh, go behind the sun as uh, viewed from Earth, but that won't happen until October. So for the next... Uh, uh, throughout July, August, September, Mars is going to be very, very low on the horizon. Um, so if we continue through the month, we see that Venus is getting lower and lower and lower. Uh, oh, this this is the star Regulus uh, in the constellation Leo, seen here, if you can see that. Uh, until By the 31st, Venus is just above the horizon at 10.30. Now, why is that happening? Because a few months ago, I said Venus is popping up after uh, swinging out from behind the sun. If we view Venus through a telescope, uh, you would see this uh, view, uh, starting with the uh, lower right hand. Uh, as Venus emerges from behind the Sun, it is almost a fully illuminated disk, though it's quite small because it's quite far away from the Earth. As it makes its way coming between the Earth and the Sun, it gets closer, so naturally it gets bigger, but less of the disk is illuminated, so the uh, we get more and more of a crescent until eventually it passes in front of the Sun, um, and then emerges on the other side, and then the, the whole process reverses, starting with a rather large crescent, and then shrinking, but getting a more illuminated disk. The cycle of Venus's uh, waxing and waning uh, repeats every uh, time it swings out from behind the sun, passes in front of the sun, and then goes behind it again. However, its position in the sky does not repeat. It's because uh, when Venus uh, pops out from behind the Sun, um, it uh, happens in different seasons on Earth. There are five paths that Venus follows in the sky in the evening, and there's also uh, five paths that it follows in the morning sky. This cycle repeats itself every eight years, and this chart shows the uh, five cycles. You can see there's actually six because uh, the first and the last one are the same cycle. So this is the uh, cycle that we're in right now and uh, beginning in April uh, Venus uh, started to show up uh, very low in the evening sky in the uh, west-northwest rose up to uh, the altitude pretty much we see it now and then it is starting to make its way south staying pretty much at the same uh, height above the horizon at uh, sunset uh, and it'll stay there until uh, September when it will start to climb up uh, and where it reaches its peak in early December 
So as I showed, um, keeping the uh, time at 10.30, the, uh, uh, the, the planet Venus seems to be sinking uh, as we go through the month, but actually what's happening is the Sun is setting earlier, Venus is staying the same uh, distance above the horizon in relationship to the Sun throughout that month. So instead of going to look at Venus and seeing it in the same position in the sky throughout the summer at the same time, what you have to do is look at the same time after sunset, say 45 minutes after sunset. Throughout the summer you go out and, and look into the west, uh, well the north, uh, west northwest and then gradually through the summer uh, the west and then um, a little bit further south each day and Venus will be about the same height throughout uh, the summer at 45 minutes after sunset. So that is why uh, uh, Venus is appears to be setting even though it, it, it's not. <laughs> now Mars and Venus aren't the only planets uh, that we can see in uh, with the naked eye in the month of July. So I've advanced the clock to July the 14th and I'm going to advance uh, day by day and what do we have here on the uh, 16th just popping up over the horizon. Oh here comes the moon. Saturn. Saturn is now entering the uh, late evening sky as we go through the month and by the end of the month Jupiter uh, joins it as well. Now at the beginning of the month uh, Saturn rises at 11.06 and Jupiter 11.47. By the end of the month uh, Saturn is coming up at 9.28 and Jupiter is coming up at 10.09. Now they're uh, in July at 1030 of course it's they're still fairly low to the horizon so if uh, you know certainly you can see them with your naked eye uh, if you looked at them uh, with a uh, pair of binoculars or a, or a small telescope uh, the view may not be very good because you're looking through a lot of atmosphere and uh, the image will probably be distorted so you can either wait until say the end of August uh, when they will be higher up in the sky at this time or you can just stay up late uh, because they do uh, rise uh, higher uh, throughout the night. I've advanced the time to 11 p.m. Uh, make the sky a little bit darker and I've also added the uh, astronomical uh, outlines of the uh, various constellations just to see what else is going on in the sky and I made the date the 16th so I've, I've gone to the middle of the month so let's see what we got here so there is uh, Leo who uh, rises in March and he's just about done he's uh, heading for the barn as it were um, he'll uh, stay uh, in the region of the Sun uh, throughout the end of uh, July and into August and uh, then he will uh, re-emerge into the morning sky and then um, as the uh, months go by uh, come March Leo will be uh, coming over the horizon at uh, sundown as he uh, has done for uh, many many centuries Okay, so whoops, we'll just try and move down here. So, um, looking straight up, uh, Ursa Major or the Big Dipper, if you will, which was rise riding fairly high up in the sky, is now uh, getting a little bit lower. Uh, we see the constellation Hercules almost directly overhead. Um, Draco, Ursa Minor. Um, anchored by the pole star just simply goes whoops, around and around throughout the year at the same time. Over in the north 
northeast we see Perseus uh, becoming more prominent and he will be uh, the place to look at uh, next month for his very famous meteor shower. Our friend Pegasus, the upside down flying horse, is in the east-northeast and uh, Cygnus and Lyra and Aquila, uh, the eagle, uh, who has, whose three bright stars, uh, Vega, Deneb, and Altair, make up the summer triangle. Here, I'll bring up my asterisms here. There you go. Altair, Vega, Deneb. Uh, so they will uh, get steadily higher and higher through the summer and uh, by the fall uh, it will be uh, directly overhead. Looking along the ecliptic, which is this green line here, uh, this is the path that the uh, sun, the moon, and the planets travel. Uh, we see Leo finishing its time uh, for this year, uh, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio. Scorpio never gets above the horizon fully uh, from Edmonton. Sagittarius and Capricorn and uh, there's a bit of Aquarius uh, just popping up at 11 p.m. at night. I've switched to the morning sky and uh, set the time at 4.30 in the morning at Mountain Daylight Time. Now, uh, you will notice uh, over here in the east-northeast is Mercury very, very low to the horizon, only a couple of degrees above the horizon at 4.30. Uh, the sun, uh, by the way, comes up at 5.16, um, so uh, about three quarters of an hour from now, uh, from this time I've set here. But what you have here, you have Mercury joined by a very, very old moon, Let's see, let's zoom in on that here. Very, very old moon. It's uh, 28 days old. Um, be a tough target, uh, especially in the morning twilight, but it might be worth uh, uh, an attempt to uh, have a look. Let's just expand our view a bit here. Okay. So going across the sky, uh, we have Uranus, which is a object uh, you can see in binoculars or a small telescope in Aries. And on the border between Pisces and Aquarius, we have Neptune. A uh, small telescope can resolve Neptune as a beautiful uh, blue, bluey green object. Can very, very bright Jupiter, and uh, still fairly bright, but not as bright as Jupiter, uh, Saturn uh, in Capricorn. As we advance through the month, we see Mercury uh, setting as it uh, passes behind the Sun, and uh, Jupiter and Saturn uh, continuing to dominate the early morning sky. Now on the 24th uh, we have the moon uh, south of Saturn and then on the 25th it's uh, south of Jupiter and then on the 27th it's south of Neptune and we'll go to the morning of the 30th and try to move our map here uh, for the southern delta aquarian meteor shower uh, the radiant is about here and I'll have more on that a little bit later. Uh, it's a fairly quiet meteor shower, uh, 15 to 20 an hour. 
unfortunately, we've got the uh, moon, a uh, white waning gibbous moon, uh, 21 days old, uh, still fairly bright, and it will wash out um, the fainter meteors. And of course, uh, for best meteor viewing, it's always good to get get away from the city uh, to to view a meteor shower. As we go toward the end of the month, this is uh, the 31st, um, the sun is now coming up at 541. You may have noticed as I uh, page through the days, the sky got a little bit darker. And we reach the end of perpetual twilight. And we also see uh, the constellations of the winter starting to come up again. Our Taurus is already uh, well above the horizon, uh, we see the top of Orion the Hunter, and uh, Gemini is almost fully above the horizon as well. And I'll just close this section uh, with a little whimsy here. Uh, I've adjusted the view to point straight up, and if you were in a dark site um, through the month of July and you had a camera that took a picture at the same time, in this case 3 a.m. Um, every night at the same time you could see the uh, clockwork of the sky. You also notice at 3 a.m. as we get out of perpetual twilight the stars are coming out and the sky is actually black at 3 a.m. by the end of the night. And If we go into August start to see the Milky Way come out. So, that's pretty cool. And that's the end of uh, this section. Okay, um, I should mention, because uh, we had the solstice uh, last month uh, where the sun rose at 5.04 and set at 10.07. The beginning of the, or today, uh, the sun came up at 5.14 and will set at 10.02. And by the end of the month, um, it's rising at 5.41 and setting it at 9.38. Oh, are there any questions? And Alistair, do you have anything to add? Um, a, a small thing to add. Um, it, during your animation, you notice how the moon was passing below the, the green line of where the planets are passing. Right. And the... Um, the, the way the lunar orbit works uh, essentially is it's at a tilt to the rest of the solar system by a little bit. And so um, it, it takes a full 18 years and change to go through its cycle in uh, two to three years going to be the lowest possible it could get uh, if for, the, for a summer moon, um, even lower than it is now. And then over the next following 18 years, it'll get not so low. Uh, so it's just one of those things where it's, it's really cool to see it. It'll be just not grazing the horizon, the low horizon, but it'll be, you know, at best yellow because it, it uh, instead of being uh, you know, brilliant white as we often see it in winter. Yeah, I did notice uh, the full moon of June. It was quite yellow until it went into the clouds. I, I didn't stay up all night like you and uh, Luca did, but uh, anyway, great. Okay, we'll go to the moon section. Speaking of the moon. What do you see when you look at the moon? When it's full and round, do you see a balloon? Does it look like a cookie with a bite taken out? What do you see when you look at the moon? It follows a path. Okay, the moon is going to be new on July the 9th, uh, two days from now. First quarter is. It says the 17th. 17th, yes. Oh, I must have missed that. Uh, it's full on the 23rd. Um, the full moon in uh, July is also is known as the uh, buck moon uh, because the deer are starting to get their horns. It's also known as the thunder moon, I presume because of uh, storms and such. Wart moon, I have no idea why they call that the wart moon or the hay moon. 
um, as uh, people are getting their uh, crop of hay. And I, Lori and I were out of town for the last couple of days out in the country, and we didn't notice a lot of haying going on in the fields as we drove by. Um, now, I use the uh, <clears throat> RASC Observe the Moon uh, certificate program uh, to pick out the features that I uh, uh, highlight every month. Uh, this map is from the uh, Observe the Moon with Binoculars uh, guide. Uh, it is uh, the Observe the Moon certificate program uh, is, uh, is a very worthwhile thing. I think anyone uh, should try. In fact, I should follow my own advice and try it myself. Uh, you can observe it with binoculars or with a telescope. Uh, record your observations, send them in, and you will get a certificate and a pin. So the feature I'm uh, using today is the gang of four. Now for certain people of, uh, who are of a certain age and who were news were and are news junkies, when you hear the term gang of four, you might think of these people. Uh, these were four very high level uh, people, including uh, Mao Zedong's wife down here, um, who were in the Chinese Communist Party and were purged and put on trial after Mao died in 1976. But we're not talking politics today. What we're talking about are a line of four craters. Uh, this is a picture of a three day old moon I took uh, a while back. And we're talking about these four guys here. They're four fairly large craters. Uh, they're on the uh, uh, edge of the moon. Uh, best seen um, three, four days after new. And this is a blow up of those uh, pictures. And they are uh, this one, which is uh, Langrenus. This one, which is uh, Mendelitis. This one, which is Petavinus. And this one, which is Fernarius. Fernarius. And there are the names there with their spelling. Now they do all appear oblong in this picture because they are near the limb and that's due to uh, foreshortening. And they are visible in binoculars or with any small telescope, even the kind of telescopes we tell people not to buy. <laughs> I have some close-ups of them. Uh, the first one, this is uh, Langrenus. It's 132 kilometers across. It's about 2.7 kilometers deep. It was named after a 17th century Belgium astronomer named Michael Florent van Lagren. As you can see, uh, this one is uh, Mendel Mendelitis. It is 147 kilometers across, 2.6 kilometers deep. As you can tell it is a very very old crater because uh, a lot of its wall has been eroded and it is full of uh, secondary impacts impacts that uh, came after this crater was formed this was also a, uh, named after a 17th century uh, belgian astronomer uh, petavinus is the largest of uh, the Gang of Four it is 177 kilometers across, 3.4 kilometers deep. It is much newer than Mendelinus, Mendelitis. Uh, it has a prominent central peak. And uh, most of these pictures are taken from lunar orbit, but this is uh, one that's taken from Earth. From a, uh, and you can see this uh, prominent central peak in the crater and also the oblong shape due to uh, foreshortening. And the last one is another old crater, uh, uh, Fernarius, 125 kilometers across, three and a half kilometers deep. It is the smallest of the gang of four. It's really old 
uh, again, with a very eroded wall, you could hardly see it and lots of secondary impacts and you can see a crack or a fault inside the crater also. So those are our lunar features for this month. And again, as I say, um, you can see them with binoculars or with uh, any small telescope. Constellation of uh, the month is Butes, the herdsman, or sometimes the plowman. So this is the star field of Butes. And this is uh, with its uh, astronomical outline put in. Um, and uh, the ancients could see this fellow. Um, I sometimes see him uh, depicted with sheep or goats around him. Uh, this guy looks more like the plowman because he's holding a scythe and his plow is right here. Uh, what we call the Big Dipper uh, in some places like in England, uh, they, they call it the plow because it kind of looks like one. Now, Butes is very kite shaped. And I suppose if uh, it was uh, being named now, it might be called the kite or uh, might be called Charlie Brown's kite. Who knows? <laughs> Features of Butes. Um, is the very bright star Arcturus. Uh, it is the fourth brightest star in the sky. It is the second brightest star in the, uh, that you can see in the Northern Hemisphere after Sirius, which is a uh, winter star. Uh, Arcturus is a red giant nearing the end of its life. It's used up all the hydrogen in its core and now is burning the hydrogen shell around the core. Uh, once it is gone, um, it will shrink again and compress and ignite the helium in its core, which kind of, it will expand again. Eventually, uh, the star will, will burn out. Now, Arcturus is kind of looking at our own sun, and there is a com size comparison of Arcturus with our own sun. This is what our own sun is going to do in uh, four five billion years from now it's going to use up all the uh, fuel hydrogen fuel in its core and it's going to swell out uh, maybe as far as uh, earth's orbit arcturus is 37 light years from earth it's 25 times the diameter of our sun and um, if you are in the summer sky and saying starlight star bright first star i see tonight chances are the first star is going to be arcturus To find Arcturus, uh, well, let me go back here. You uh, follow the curve of the handle of the Big Dipper, you arc to Arcturus. Follow the curve and it'll point uh, to the bright star Arcturus. And it does look uh, orangey red, even to the naked eye on uh, clear nights. Doesn't really have a lot of deep sky objects in uh, Butes. Uh, there is one globular cluster, this guy here, NGC 5466, which was discovered by William Herschel in 1784. It's visible in a mid-sized scope. It's 51,800 light years from Earth, contains thousands and thousands of stars. There it is there. And this is a photograph of uh, NGC uh, 5466, um, your typical globular cluster, thousands and thousands of stars uh, clumped very close together by gravity. Other highlights this month. We've got, as I mentioned before, uh, we've got a conjunction of Moon, Venus, and Mars low in the northwest at dusk. You need a very clear horizon to see it, I'm going to try and uh, get uh, use my uh, meager photographic skills to uh, get some pictures of that. Hopefully, it'll be clear that night. Uh, Mars and Venus on the 13th, half a degree apart. Again, low in the evening twilight. 
Uh, the moon is south of Saturn on the 24th. It's south of uh, Jupiter on the 25th and south of Neptune on the 27th, always south as Alistair explained, uh, the moon is approaching its lowest uh, point in its 18 year cycle along the ecliptic. The lunar X, uh, one of my favorite features is visible for a few hours on July the 16th, starting around 5.02 in the afternoon. So. It can be seen in the daytime. I've seen it uh, many times in the daytime. And uh, as I mentioned, the Southern Delta Aquarian meteor shower peaks on the morning of the 30th. Uh, the moon is not your friend. It's in the sky. It's going to uh, wash out uh, fainter meteors. It's, it's, like I said earlier, it's 15 to 20 meteors an hour is the average. And it's our last chance to see noctilucent clouds this year, the night shining clouds. Uh, we've had a really good year this year. Um, usually we get one, maybe two really good displays in a typical year. We've had what, four or five now? Yeah. So because this is my deal, all these photographs are mine. <laughs> so this is a display on the um, uh, 20th, 20, uh, evening of the 20th, morning of the 21st, uh, just after, uh, not long after sunset, uh, they were really bright and they're really high up. Usually they hang around the northern uh, horizon, but these were uh, really high, as you can see the top of my house there. So I was pointing up fairly high up to see these things. And uh, as I said, they're really, really bright. And uh, after I took those pictures at my house, I went over to a local schoolyard and uh, you know, you can see how high these things got. Wow, it's a great, great display. And then on the uh, 27th, uh, there was another really, really good display that uh, there's a few more pictures I took. And this is a couple short movies I put together of uh, a time-lapse of the, uh, because the the NLC, the uh, noctilus and clouds they actually do move uh, over time. Okay, and uh, as I mentioned, the lunar X is visible on the sixteenth. There it is, right there. Uh, it's only visible for about four hours, and uh, so get out around five o'clock in the afternoon if it's clear and uh, have a look. Uh, you'll need a really good pair, a steady pair of binoculars or a small telescope and you will see it. It's quite prominent actually. First time I saw it, I was surprised how easy it was to spot. And uh, as I mentioned, the uh, Southern Delta uh, Aquarius meteor shower. And uh, there's the uh, Jupiter is in Aquarius it's right there and the uh, radiant is right there, but you don't have to stare at the radiant. You can if you want, because the meteors go all over the sky, all over. And now we'll go to the space history part. Oh, right, there's the radiant. added a little music to my title. Now, uh, for those of you who've never sat in on one of these, um, I always pick um, an event that happened in the month, uh, an anniversary year that is divisible by five. So for this year, the uh, year has to end in a one or a six. So we're gonna go to Mars. It's in the news a lot. So since 1997, uh, Mars has had spacecraft operating on it or orbiting it continuously from 1997 to now. Starting with the uh, Mars Pathfinder, which landed on uh, July the 4th, 1997. And the Mars Pathfinder carried the first rover to be deployed on Mars. This little uh, um, 
prospector, which was about the size of a microwave oven. And since then, we've had the uh, Mars, or pardon me, not prospector, um, sojourner, sorry. Uh, we've had the uh, Mars Global Surveyor, uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the Spirit and Opportunity Rovers, uh, the uh, Mars Express, the Phoenix Lander, up to now Curiosity and Perseverance. Now these aren't all of them, these are just some of them. Uh, since 97, uh, spacecraft from the US, Russia, European Space Agency, India, United Arab Emirates, and China have operated around or on Mars. But the first craft to land on Mars was Viking 1, which uh, landed this month in 1976. This is a uh, photograph of the uh, Viking spacecraft. There were two of them, Viking 1 and Viking 2. There were, uh, back in the day, NASA always launched two spacecraft at a planetary target in case one failed. And in a lot of cases, that was uh, good thinking. For example, the very first uh, craft to survey Mars in 1965, Mariner 4, uh, was the second craft launched at Mars. Mariner 3 ended up in the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Um, the first craft to orbit Mars was uh, Mariner 9. Mariner 8 ended up in the Atlantic Ocean. So, oh, we got somebody entering here. Okay. Uh, Viking was a two part spacecraft. Uh, very much reminded me of the Apollo program uh, with an orbiter and lander combination that went into orbit on uh, June the 19th, 1976. The orbiter is this part here. The lander is in this aero shell here. Now it was originally gonna land on uh, July the 4th, 1976, which would have been the 200th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, 200th birthday for the United States. Uh, they picked the landing site based on the uh, pictures taken by the Mariner 9 orbiter. Uh, what Viking, the Viking orbiter had better cameras. And uh, when it looked at the landing site, it said, oh, it's too rough. Uh, we can't guarantee that the lander is going to survive. So they picked another spot and uh, went for landing on July the 20th, 1976. And I have a little animation from uh, that time with 70s music. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Um, this is a picture of the incomplete spacecraft in uh, uh, assembly and testing. As you can see, it's quite a large spacecraft. And uh, this is the lander with some people standing next to it. So the lander was a fairly beefy spacecraft also, uh, really until Curiosity and uh, Perseverance, the rovers that are on Mars right now, uh, there was no really big spacecraft on Mars. So as I said, on July the 20th, uh, 1976, seven years to the day that uh, Apollo 11 Eagle landed on the moon, uh, 32 days to the day, 32 years to the day that the Valkyrie plot to kill Hitler didn't work out. <laughs> so as I say, I have a little movie here.
and Viking 1 continues, continued in orbit for many, many years. So, as I said, on July 20th, 76, uh, Viking 1 landed on Mars. And the very first picture returned from the surface of Mars was this. Now, this is a tradition uh, with American landers that the very first picture they always take is of their own foot. And this is to determine that the lander has landed safely, that it isn't sinking into dust, that it hasn't landed on a rock, and the leg is uh, perched precariously above the ground. And this is uh, something that started uh, back with the surveyor lander on the moon and continues to this day with the Phoenix lander, which landed on Mars. So anything that the US puts on the surface of a planet with legs, the very first picture is always gonna be of its own foot. So this is the very first panorama uh, that was taken uh, by Viking. And I have a few pictures here. Uh, this this instrument here, this is the uh, weather station. Uh, it's perched on the very top of it, top of this arm. And there's the high gain antenna that it uses to uh, uh, communicate with Earth. Uh, this is what um, the cameras on uh, on these space probes are not color cameras. They're actually black and white cameras, and they uh, have a series of red, uh, blue, and green filters that they. Uh, put in front of the lens and snap a picture and then they combine them uh, back on Earth and they do a little jigging with the uh, picture. This is one of the early pictures from Mars and uh, uh, the people doing the processing expected that the sky would be blue. Uh, so they made the sky blue, but it's actually not blue. It's uh, more kind of a tan or a salmon color. Uh, Viking, uh, the Vikings carried an arm which dug into the surface and uh, lifted soil and put them, dumped them into sample containers uh, within the uh, spacecraft uh, for analysis. I'm sure uh, some of you or all of you maybe have heard of the Martian meteorites. And uh, if you want to ask, how do you know that the meteorite came from Mars? It's because of the work done uh, by Viking analyzing the soil uh, uh, on, on, uh, it, and uh, then when they uh, examine the meteors, they say, hey, this is made of the same stuff the Viking is seeing on Mars. So this meteor came from Mars. Again, there's the weather instrument there. Now, what did my uh, Viking find? Uh, it carried, Viking 1 carried a seismometer, which was the only instrument that didn't work. It failed. Uh, they found that the surface is a type of iron-rich clay that releases uh, oxygen when wetted. Uh, they carried some uh, experiments that would uh, wet the soil just to see what would happen. They found no sign of organic chemistry by uh, either the gas chronometer or the mass spectrometer, but they did detect a weird chemistry uh, in one experiment that seemed to indicate there was life present. Uh, they would uh, feed uh, the soil samples some nutrient and then uh, measure gases that would come out of the soil. And they thought, oh my goodness, uh, it's uh, releasing gases uh, you would expect for life. But when they repeated the experiment after they sterilized the soil, they got the same result. So there's some sort of weird chemistry going on on Mars. Um, couldn't find any life. Uh, they, uh, the Viking carried an X-ray spectrometer which measured the composition of the soil. Uh, the weather, weather instruments uh, found that the wind was a lot lighter than what they expected because of global dust storms that could be observed from Earth and were greeted by Mariner 9 when it went into orbit in uh, the early 70s, uh, where it couldn't see anything on the surface because of these global dust storms. They expected winds to be several hundred kilometers per hour, but uh, the strongest measured gust they ever measured on Mars was 120 kilometers an hour. They also found that the atmospheric pressure varied 30% during the year as uh, the CO2 uh, condensed and sublimated uh, through the seasons. 
Uh, a surprising result was that they found nitrogen in the atmosphere, which is something they did not expect. Uh, they found that the temperature ranged, uh, the air temperature, um, minus 14 Celsius in the summer at midday uh, to 120 degrees, minus 120 degrees Celsius at night in the winter. Uh, Viking 1 lander functioned until November 11th, 1982 when, uh, oh, I should mention these, uh, these landers were nuclear powered like Perseverance and Curiosity, they weren't solar powered. So they could have run for uh, many, many years. They used uh, uh, plutonium uh, to power the uh, radioactive thermoelectric generators. Anyway, um, on November 11th, 1982, they uh, uh, sent up some uh, new computer uh, instructions uh, to the lander to, uh, to fix a problem they were having with uh, its storage batteries. Uh, and uh, there was a uh, error in the code and it uh, told the lander to point its, an its antenna at the ground. And that was the last they heard of it. Uh, the orbiter functioned until August 17th, 1980. It may still be in orbit, maybe not. Uh, there was a second lander, Viking 2, which uh, entered orbit on uh, the uh, 7th of August and landed on uh, the 3rd of uh, September in 1976. And uh, they lost contact with uh, that spacecraft on the uh, uh, April the 12th. Uh, 1980. So that's it. Um, our next what's up is on August the 4th uh, at 7.30 Mountain Daylight Time. I also, also uh, would like to mention heavensabove.com, which is a uh, treasure trove of information for what's up in the sky uh, throughout uh, the month, throughout the year, actually, satellite sightings, etc. cetera. Uh, check it out. And with that, I will say thank you. And uh, are there any questions? You could unmute yourself uh, if you wish. One of the things, Jeff, that is, as well, that you had uh, brought up in the earlier segment with uh, the, the changing sunrise and sunset times is that um, because it's, it's the, we're at the top of the curve, the change day to day is only sort of few seconds, few seconds, and then it just goes and it, it I, you know, I, I've been here more than half my life now, and it still catches me off guard at just how quickly the uh, the times change from, you know, just like it, it gets cloudy for a week, and then all of a sudden it's clear, and, you know, it's just like, what? The sun's setting, like, <laughs> 45 minutes earlier. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, I, I notice that it's more, more in the winter, I guess, because... Uh, well, now that I'm retired, I don't do this anymore, but I would always drive east to get to work and drive west coming home. And uh, of course, around sunrise, the sun is always in my eyes. You know, there's a part, point in time where the sun is in my eyes going to work and the sun is in my eyes coming home. So I, I always notice, <laughs> note the, uh, uh, the rapid uh, change in the time. Any other questions, comments, insults, jokes? Oh, for anyone interested, it's one nothing Tampa Bay with 950 to go. Not looking good for the Habs. <laughs> Ye of little faith. Yeah, well, <laughs> gosh, you know, Tampa is just such a good team. Oh, well, riot tonight. Yeah, well, there's riots when they win. Imagine, mm -hmm. you know. I, I you know. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other thing um, to to uh, pay attention to is uh, just that. Um, well, with the the rapid change, 
if especially if you're um, getting um, imaging gear with your camera and whatnot, um, is that it's a, it's a bad habit of a lot of people to say, oh, I've got some new gear, I'll take it to the either the Summer Saskatchewan Star Party or the Northern Prairie Star Party. And there's new gear always comes with um, bugs and gremlins and, and, and stuff. And so uh, the advice is while it's summer twilight, even though you're not taking great pictures, you can at least troubleshoot your gear so that when it is dark, when, when you're well out of town at one of these star parties, then every, you've got the, the functioning down. So practice now. Oh, there's a question there. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, because I, uh, you know, that's a good question. Uh, if you come back next month, I'll have the answer. Um, or maybe Alistair knows. Uh, uh, about half more. Uh, so even from the southern Alberta, you still cannot see the stinger. But you can see more of it more of the, the overall body, but the stinger still stays below the horizon for uh, southern Alberta. Yeah, I've only ever seen the whole um, whole of Scorpio when I go to su southern Ontario to visit my wife's in-laws. You know, then I can see the whole thing. Yeah, the the place to see it is uh, in the southern hemisphere <laughs> when it's it's overhead. It's uh, spectacular. Yeah, and there's a lot of stuff in Scorpio too. So yeah, a lot of good deep sky objects. Yeah, there's uh, there's uh, in the tail area. There's something called the False Comet. Uh, there's a a star cluster. Um, well, actually, two star clusters, one comet and another one that's sort of diffuse that looks like the tail of a comet. And so when Halley's Comet went by in 86, there are people, oh, yeah, I see it. At, at, and it's like, what time of day were you looking or night were you looking at this? Oh, there's a, oh you were looking at the tail of Scorpius. No, no, I'm sure it was the comet. But, no, sorry, that was not the comet. Mm. Okay. But uh, uh, I can vouch for southern Alberta. Um, the skies are very dark. Uh, there's uh, all the, the light pollution of Calgary is off to the, the north. Um, the smaller cities of Lethbridge and Medicine Hat do not put out much. And there's very little south of the border in Montana. It is, you get spectacular skies uh, uh, in writing on stone park and, and neighboring areas. Uh, Red Rock Coulee is a super cool place as well. If you've never been there, uh, check it out. It's not that far from Medicine Hat, about 45 minutes or something like that. But it's another one of these things where it's like, you know, half alien world. Where did all these red rocks come from? Uh, but uh, the one thing to uh, prepare yourself with if you're going to uh, stargaze in southern Alberta is some form of windbreak, uh, or at least if you can set up behind your car, cause it's windy down there yeah. a lot. Yeah, we've been down down south a few times, and yeah, not that's why always. All the, that's why all the uh, that's why all the uh, wind generators are down there. So yeah, it's not always windy but it's mostly mostly, mostly yeah you know when we went to uh, scotland uh, what a couple of years ago in edinburgh they said it doesn't rain all the time just most of the time <laughs> oh what do we got we got another one? Oh, thanks okay all right well if there's nothing else um i will say good night uh thanks to alistair for joining me and thank you to all of you for uh, joining us uh, tonight. Uh, this is recorded and it'll be posted on the RESC Edmonton YouTube channel uh, in a few days. I will take out all the uh, mistakes, <laughs> like starting without sound and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, 
Great. And uh, hopefully we'll see some of you or all of you uh, next month. So uh, thank you very much. Have and good night. Good.